Hey guys. Hello again. I'm Marty Kine. Welcome to what I'm calling my Back to Work webinars. This is the greatest hits of webinars I've done over the years, and this is one of my favorites, What Marketers Can Learn from Hollywood. And you might say, what do you, Marty Kine, former Gartner analyst, current employee of Salesforce, know about Hollywood? Well, in fact, I do have a relationship with Hollywood. Back when I was a management consultant, I wrote a book called House of Lies, and that was turned into a television program, and Don Cheadle, well, you can see him there, played a guy named Marty Kahn, and my name is Marty Kine, and he was based on me, and I would have to say extremely loosely based. But I do know a little bit about Hollywood. I'm not an expert, but uh, as an observer, I'll say. I have some credibility. And uh, what are America's most successful industries? So uh, if you define success as having exports way in excess of imports, that is the world needs this product, um, sheer volume of influence, um, uh, how much how much power that industry has compared to competitors around the world in Europe and Asia. The two most successful industries by far that America has um, uh, are the defense industry, our you know massive defense infrastructure, and Hollywood. And I think culturally the the influence of Hollywood is even greater. Uh, how is marketing done in the defense industry? I have no idea whatsoever. I, I assume it's a hand shakes and so stuff that you and I don't know anything about. So I can't really comment. But uh, marketers can learn a lot from Hollywood. And that's my topic today. So name this movie. I will describe it to you. Um, there is uh, two characters. They're very different. One has a certain set of personality characteristics, uh, very sweet, and likable. And the other one's kind of a little bit more bitter and acerbic. And, and they meet. They kind of bump into each other. And uh, Somehow together, they're kind of greater than the sum of their parts. Together, they make sense and they become a big hit. They're much more popular than they were individually. And uh, they have a glorious future that inc includes a lot of different sequels and spinoffs. Well, what is that movie? Well, it's about every movie, every romantic comedy, but actually it's the story of Reese's, the product. You have peanut butter over here, you have chocolate over here. They come together in this glorious synergy. And... Uh, what I'm talking about is an epic narrative that is actually a consumer product. And you can see that uh, this product, Reese's in particular, who I follow avidly as a big fan, has been very good at adapting some Hollywood techniques. You can even see the wrapping here. Looks a bit like a curtain, doesn't it? It's sort of a squishy, a little bit curtain-like. It says limited edition, so there's a sense that it's kind of like a movie opening. It will come out, and uh, but it's not going to stay forever, so you better go and see it quickly. Stream it now. Binge it now. And then uh, it's there's a lot of different variations on it, so there's obviously the, the, the regular Reese's that we all know and love, but lots of different versions, so I would call these line extensions or sequels, if you will. There's the big version, there's a small cup, the big cup. There's the one with mixed nuts, the ones without nuts, white chocolate, dark chocolate, peanut butter on the outside. You know what I mean. So basically, as Reese shows us, every business, I would argue now, is in a kind of a form of show business as we go after consumers' attention. So I'm going to take you through 10 marketing secrets that Hollywood knows and that marketers should know. And number 11 is going to shock you. Number one, it's actually not about storytelling. Hollywood's not about storytelling. Hollywood builds well-crafted structures based on repeatable blueprints. When I was a younger man, in my foolish younger days, I thought I would be a screenwriter. And what did I do? Well, I didn't sit down and start writing screenplays. Of course, that would be too simple. Uh, what I did was I watched the 100 most popular movies that had ever been made with a notebook, and I wrote down all the plot points because I thought there's got to be a formula here. And in fact, there is a formula. <laughs> this is a, an example sort of, a, of the general idea of the formula. I have my own formula, which I will share with you for $40,000, but this one I will just give away. It's called the hero's journey. And essentially the, the hero appears, think of Luke Skywalker, he assembles his team. So it's like buddies. And then they go off on an adventure. They leave home. Something happens. They leave home. Like in his case, it was his, um, you know, his, his, um, uh, family's home was was destroyed and burned so he, he had to go off on an adventure it's all kinds of adventures going on near death there's a betrayal at a certain point where someone close to him betrays him and then he emerges as a different person and then as you know he comes back to where he started but he's different so that's that's the basic 
theory. The greatest story ever told, of course, is, um, is Die Hard. And Die Hard, this is actually Time Cop. Time Cop and Die Hard are one and two. But um, they have actually the same structure if you look at it. So right in the middle, there's a point where it's all out in the open. You know who the good guys and the bad guys are. At 90 minutes, in a, say it's a 120 minute film, at 90 minutes, there's a point where somebody close to them, the main character, the hero, betrays them. It's this Judas moment. And in fact, if you kind of uh, harmonize the gospels, the four gospels, and you look at the Jesus story, it follows this formula very well. In, in Time Cop, it was um, his so-called friend, his, his so-called partner who betrayed him at 90 seconds, you can see it. So there's a formula. And so if you are a brand um, and you're trying to tell the story of your brand, come up with your elevator pitch, but make sure that it adheres to this formula, which is basically you appear, there's some kind of problem, you're solving that problem. What is the way that you solve it? You confront some kind of an, an enemy and then there's a, there's a happy ending. And um, what do I mean by that? Well, think about Google. What is Google's um, pitch to the world? They're like, we organize the world's information. So there is an enemy. They are the hero. Google's a hero. There is an enemy, disorganized information. And then the end point is this Edenic you know, afterworld, which is a world of wonderfully organized information. Okay, and here are the format. Number two, build a world. So your brand should be a world. I mean, the movie, we enter the movie uh, any kind of movie television show, we enter it in part to leave our world and enter their world. I mean, think about Game of Thrones. That's a radically different world, not one I want to go to. But if you're a brand, there's a lot of success in creating your own world. I mean, you could do it literally the way Nike did. Um, they have the Nike world, and you enter Nike world, or Disney has their own world. But you could do it even virtually, or you could do it um, kind of more spiritually. This is a promotion for a hot dog brand, where they created a sweeps experience on an app, and um, in digital channels you can see they're on the browser and ipad and you know they created a virtual world it's like coney island and so that is a world that i will enter to be with that brand number three have a hero there's always a hero in a hollywood screen and in fact in the, in the western world we would say that the hero is um the heroes in about 75 80 percent of the scenes that they are very dominant there is a main character and we are supposed to identify and see everything through their eyes um, the, the nuance here, though, with a brand is that the hero cannot be the brand. And this mistake is often made. I think IBM does it well with this Watson. Watson is, uh, is Watson's not a thing. There's no server called Watson, as far as I know. Watson is more of a state of mind. It's a, it's a set of capabilities. But they create the hero to be Watson. And, and it's, so it's not IBM. It's IBM Watson. And um, that's the right way to go. You need a hero, but it, it can't be the brand because that's really, that's extremely off-putting. It's narcissistic. This is a promotion that Mercedes-Benz did a while ago where they, um, they allowed people to use their, they, they kind of took over their Instagram and they let people take pictures and they went on a road trip driving around in their Mercedes-Benz, obviously. And so, you know, the stream was essentially this person's adventure. But these were customers, prospects of Mercedes-Benz. It wasn't the brand itself that wasn't the hero. It was the person, you know, the customer. So make the customer the hero. Be an event planner. <laughs> the event planner. This is pretty cool. If we think about one a day, one a day now is in the vitamin category. Those of you who know the vitamin category know that it is quite literally a commodity. It has to be a commodity because these have to be approved by the FDA. There is a monograph, and a monograph defines what the molecule is. So every vitamin that you buy, I mean, some are more pure than others, I guess, but every vitamin that you buy is vitamin C is the same as every other vitamin C. So how do you differentiate? Well, one of the is genius at this. They have so many life, uh, line extensions that come out, different combinations marketed at different segments. And one of these here said it was actually really funny in a way. It said helps convert food into energy. So even some of the claims that they make are very creative, but it's on a schedule. It is like a television program. These are line extensions that are scheduled to come out. Um, brands should do that. Creating events. Uh, this is one for Ulta that was like, it's our birthday and we're going to celebrate you. So this, you know, is a great excuse. It's our birthday, 25 years. Um, it's, it's an event. We all like events. We all like parties and we like celebrations. Organize around projects. There was an article in the New York Times four or five years ago that was very eye-opening. This reporter had, um, yeah, I guess 
kind of made their day. They were called on to a, a movie set or television set and asked to be a, an expert consultant on a topic. So, um, and they wrote about the experience because they had never been, this is a reporter, newspaper reporter, they'd never been on a set before. Strangely enough, I know everyone's been on a set, but, and they were shocked. They're like, wow, these people are so professional. You know, the lighting people and the, the guy with the mic, the gaffer, and then people laying down the, the, um, like the, um, power cords and then the, the director of photography and it's a huge screen a huge team there and then they have the catering and it all works together and and they don't know each other some of them like they just come together and they're very professional and then they go off they go off and, and sort of disband and reband somewhere else with a different group of people they said this is the future of work it'll be these self-assembling teams and i thought has this person never heard of you know scrum or software development um this is, I mean, this is a great way to work where people have defined roles and they know what they're doing. And so it can be applied in a corporate environment. Now, corporations don't tend to be set up this way, obviously. But what Delta Airlines did a while back, um, they had to sort of completely change their IT infrastructure. This is around the time, just after the merger with Northwest. So they had a lot to do. And they, they essentially organized around projects. So they'd have people in different divisions like IT, marketing, product pricing procurement and they they rather than being siloed and kind of working in their waterfall they they would organize themselves around a project like um, the kiosk so they'd have the kiosk sub team and taking people from different teams and that's very much sort of the the scrum or the agile method and that's that's the way movie sets succeed so create false scarcity i took a screenwriting class or a um, storytelling class with Robert McKee, who's a very famous sort of guru in this field. And he gave some tips at the end. And one of the tips he gave was, if you can ever have a countdown clock in your movie, some kind of countdown, do it. The other thing he said was don't do voiceovers, which I agree with completely. But um, he said that's the sign. And Martin Scorsese says he should listen to that one. But um, if you can ever do some kind of countdown, ticking time bomb, do it, because it creates a lot of, you know, excitement and i see this all over the place and it works really nicely um hotels.com obviously does it if you you know pre-pandemic when people went to hotels but if you go in the app it'll say you know uh for only you know four people have, have booked this room only, only one left one left at this price if you go to um cable television you know um, direct response television they're great at that they have the countdown clock um starbucks does it They'll have limited editions. You know, um, McDonald's will have the Sham Shamrock Shake that comes out. So that, that's, just, in a sense, a ticking time bomb. If you don't go, you, you miss out. Get emotional. Don't be afraid to be emotional. And the reason I say that is there have been a lot of studies around the if efficacy of advertising. And in fact, it doesn't even matter what emotion you elicit. The only way to rise above the noise, the noise of excess of content, is to uh, uh, elicit and emotion in the person. And it can be uh, any one of these. It can be surprise, fear. Hopefully it's something positive, I would hope, like uh, happiness or joy. But it can be something like disgust. And they will remember you. And in fact, the correlation with purchase, believe it or not, shows that it doesn't matter whether the emotion is positive or negative. As long as there's an emotion, people are more likely to buy. This one I like. This is the Budweiser one. It's like a Really pulls at the old heartstrings, doesn't it? Choose your enemies. This is a good one. It's um, if you are a brand and you're trying to show that you are victorious. In, in Hollywood, Bruce Lee was a master of this. He would appear, and this is Bruce Lee, one guy, and he would be surrounded by all of these people, usually wearing you know white karate outfits, who were out to get him. They were gonna, you know, there's 30, 40 people, and there's one guy in the middle. So he would pick them off one by one. Now I kept thinking, and I still don't understand why they didn't all just rush him at once. They probably could have, you know, he would have won anyway, but, um, but he, you know, he picked them off in groups of one, groups of two. So he, he picked the terms of the fight so he could win. Um, brands could do this as well. This was a funny prank that was at South by Southwest a few years ago, where Zappos said pay with a cupcake. Go Google had a food truck, and basically, if you answered some question, they would give you a cup free cupcake. And then Zappos was like, "Hey, bring your cupcake that you got from this other place, and you know we'll give you something real." And it's like a prank. Um, what was funny about it is, though, if you think about it, Zappos and Google don't compete. 
you know, they're not, they're not competitive brands. It's just sort of a gratuitous prank, but they picked a, you know, a, a situation where they could do a little one-upmanship that was a little bit harmless. Domo does this as well. I mean, Domo, when they, uh, they had did a, a big ad campaign for a number of years where they compared themselves to spreadsheets. So they would say, we have this great, um, this great dashboard product and uh, it's, it's so much better than, you know, building your own dashboard using Excel. And so the, the truth is though, they're not really, like no one would think Domo competes with Excel. I mean, I suppose it does in a way, but they actually compete with other dashboard products, don't they? Um, but they didn't pick them. They didn't pick direct competitors. They picked something else. And it was almost like a fight that, you know, put them in a better light, one that they could win, but it's not actually quite, quite fair, the comparison. So pick your enemies that way. Number nine, regulate yourself. This is uh, often neglected because I suppose it's less sexy, but the movie business is self-regulating. Um, the ratings, Motion Picture Association rates movies and, it, and it's quite strict and movies have to be edited to comply so they don't get an R rating. And the reason that this is in place is so that the, that the movie business can regulate itself. Why? So that a government doesn't regulate it because once the government gets involved, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. So they lose control of their own destiny. In the uh, digital advertising space, for instance, um, IAB, industry bodies, people like that are, are the self-regulating, you know, consortia and that is the way to go do what hollywood does don't freak out so when i was a kid my father worked in uh, he was a trauma surgeon and he worked in the er and um his job he would come home from work and he'd be tired the way the way i am now kind of at the same age and and i'd say what happened dad i said oh you know uh, i landed in a helicopter at the highway and we had to kind of blowtorch a guy out of the car and uh, he'd had a horrible car accident and uh, he didn't make it, so we lost this guy. And he's like, I'm a little stressed out, uh, but uh, you know, I'll have dinner. This is just part of his job. So I decided at that point, I don't want any kind of job where there's <laughs> any stakes like that. That's not my jam, man. Uh, so I got into advertising. That, that is not your job. You're not saving lives. None of this is life and death. Mar marketing, believe it me or, or not, is not life and death. Your job is, is supposedly to have fun, sell some product, entertain. So what is number 11? The secret, Hollywood secret number 11 that marketers should, can use. Uh, can anyone guess this sitting out there in the world? Can you guess number 11? It's a really, really, really amazing. You're not gonna believe it. When I show you this, you're gonna be like, what? Marty, it's gonna change your life, buddy. Suspense. See what I did there? Suspense. So how can a brand use suspense? Suspense is very powerful. Apple is the master at this. Steve Jobs in particular, he would get up on the stage and he'd do his three hour long, highly rehearsed presentation. And then at the end, everyone knew this was coming. He'd be like, one more thing. And then he'd introduce the iPhone, the iPad. You know, he'd change the world. And uh, even today, like a, there'll be a new version of the iPhone that'll come out, it'll be leaked. You know, there'll be someone will find it in a bar somewhere. Like, oh, how did this happen? I don't know, you know. But um, it's, it'd be speculation. What's going to be in it? People can't wait. Another brand that's really good at that is um, they're sort of in trouble these days with CrossFit. And uh, Reebok, I know, is, is uh, disaffiliated from CrossFit. But in general, in the old days, the good old days, CrossFit is, is a master at suspense. They, they do the CrossFit games. I know because I'm a CrossFitter, quite obviously, you can tell. Um, and they would, they would not release the workout for the games until the night before. Uh, or this is uh, for the Open. Um, and in the games, it's, it's the same situation. So you don't, you don't know what the athletes are going to be doing until right before. So people are perched on the edge of their, of their computer, you know, looking at the blank screen, waiting for this workout. Now, these workouts, I can't tell you, they are extremely predictable and really dumb. It'll be like jump on a box, you know, 100 times and then lift this weight. I mean, that'll be it. But everyone will be like, oh, my God, that is, there it is. I can't believe it. I'm so glad that I waited up all night to see this thing. Um, I don't know how they do it, but they're, they're a master of suspense. And I think any brand that can do it is smart. 10 things. So to recap, number one, uh, I can't quite see it because my picture's over it, but number one, it's not about, um, 
it's not about uh, creativity. It's not. It's actually about the structures. Um, uh, be an event planner, organize around projects. So use the agile method. You know, scrum around it. Create false scarcity. So if you can ever have a ticking time bomb, something counting down, do that. If you can release something and take it back, do that. Be emotional. You know, uh, connect with with your prospects on an emotional level. Pick your fights. Pick your fights and pick the fights. Obviously, I didn't say this, but that you're going to win. Do self-regulation as, as Hollywood has done so well. And number 10, don't, don't take it all too seriously. So turn it up to 11, baby. Use suspense. Uh, Jerry, that's my cat. And I uh, wish you uh, good luck in going back to work. We hope that you are doing well. And thank you for joining us today.